this morning. Um, CCE is part of the Scottish network. We've been connecting in uh, to the network for a number of years, but also had a historic and continue to have a, a link down south with um, Pioneer. But increasingly, we're trying to see ourselves connected in this nation and the importance of collaborating and learning and contributing to other churches in and around this nation that we can um, see the kingdom of God come uh, all across uh, Scotland and uh, over the last few years uh, we've been trying to bring the, the a bit more intentionality into the network and the collaboration between different churches uh, that we can work together because we don't have all that we need on our own. I think God creates us with a sense of dependency that we need others beyond ourselves and we benefit and so uh, we're the three of us are part of the Scottish Network leadership team and it's a joy to have Keith who leads that team with us and Stan who is uh, employed by the network a couple of days to kind of make stuff happen and uh, Stan's contribution over the last couple of years has been absolutely fantastic and so Stan's going to tell us uh, a little bit about kind of what's happening in the network uh, there may be some things that um, you're interested in but also it's just about understanding something that the spirit is doing wider in the nation and then Keith's going to bring a scripture and share with us so Stan it's joy to have you with us please do come and share a bit about the network and what's happening okay. even after the instructions I forget to flick the switch it's really great to be back here again um I'm married to Jill. She's not unable to be here this morning because she's got responsibilities in our home churches in Liberty and Dunfermline. Um, she's been working away from home for the last few weeks. And on Friday, it was my day off. And so um, I love cooking and we love uh, eating together and cooking together. So I decided that what we do is we make homemade tacos from scratch. So uh, she was taking the train back from Manchester. So I got together all the ingredients, all the different dishes, and we started working on it. And then when she got back in, in the evening, we put the, the charcoal on, we got the steaks out, we finished off the food there, and we sat around the table, and you could smell the charcoal, you could smell the chilies, you could smell the salsa, and we just began to share stories. The people that we'd met over that last week, the conversations we'd had, the questions they'd arisen, uh, my son loves facts, so he always regales us with something he's learned this week. And we had this wonderful two hours just around the table, a homecoming. And of course, the thing that you couldn't smell was the deep sense of connection and re-engagement. And I mention this story because at the heart of the network is a sense that we want to form that same spirit for churches and for leaders. And I want to say a big thank you to this community because you are a central part of creating that environment and that spirit around the network. You might not know it and meet on, when we, you meet on a Sunday, but you have been a place of welcome and a place of hospitality for leaders all around the nation. And that comes in the ways that you have hosted things, but also comes in the generous way that you have served with your leaders, sending people like Rupert and other people all around this room who brought their wisdom and experience to bear for churches all around Scotland. So the Scottish Network is a network of churches and a fellowship of leaders. And we are seeking to equip and to encourage and to create a place of homecoming, but also of homegoing. Because when we gather together, we also gather to go. And so we have a banner here today that I would really encourage you to have a look at at the end of the service. But it tries to capture some of the things that we're seeking to do. So for leaders, we're hoping and seeking to gather places where people can come, they can grow, they, um, that we really value being before doing. And so we want to play, create safe places for leaders. So we actually meet here. We have a hub of leaders, leadership hub here. In, the, in this building, we meet on a, on a Wednesday. We have lunch. We share together. There's another hub uh, in the West, and we also have one online. What's so exciting about the network is it's not just in the central belt. We are connected with uh, a church, small church in the Cala Locaus, in Vaness, up in Aberdeenshire, in the borders. And so we're trying to gather a group of people who are right across Scotland doing different things, but doing it in Jesus' name and for his glory, calling people to know more of him. 
We also want to seek to equip what different churches around the network are doing. And so one of the things that we do is in kind of training and information. So some of you who've been around this church for more than, I think, four or five years might know and recognize the name Ignite. Ignite is a discipleship program, and it happened here. Colin Symes was involved with leading that and running that here in this building. But we've now developed that and was in person before the pandemic. And now we have a hybrid online in-person experience. And we're just gathering, and I've been part of a small part of contributing. Ali and Liz and Liz, uh, Lizzie have also been a big part of contributing this year to the program. Uh, just as we gather people who maybe have been come to faith really recently. One of the exciting things about Ignite is we have in our church one of the ladies who's come in. She's just been a Christian for six months, but wanted to go on this year-long program. And we've also got a person in our church who used to go here, used to live in Edinburgh, now lives in Dunfermline and attends our church, who's been a Christian for 40 years. And both of them are discovering more of what it means to follow Jesus in their context and be equipped to serve. The other thing which I'm going to talk about in a moment is launch, so let me hold that. And finally, the network is there to serve and resource churches and communities just like this one. And so we're working together with leaders and their leadership teams, but we're also seeking to serve and what it might mean for us as a network to empower and to release church planting and missional movements right across this nation to serve Jesus. So I want to finish with this launch. When I was seven years old, I brought up in a, a Christian family, I went to um, Spring Harvest, and there was a, a man called Ishmael who used to lead worship. Some of the, oh, yes, absolute nutter for Jesus. And uh, at, the, at the age of six, I came back to my parents. Uh, this is a Christian festival, Spring Harvest, you never heard of it. I went back to my, our little apartment. I said to mama, I'm, my mum, I said, I have decided to follow Jesus, and one day I'm going to be a preacher. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's something the Spirit was doing at the age of six. But actually, if I look over my whole life, uh, I started in leadership in churches at the age of about 14, 15, starting to step into things. And then about the age of 25, began to be paid in, in church ministry. But the reason that I'm here and have continued is because people saw something in me and called it out. They saw something in me and they called it out. And then as I responded, they walked alongside me. So at the age of 16, one of the guys in my youth group who was a leader said, I see a leader in you. I see wisdom in you. And he called out what I couldn't see and I began to respond. When I was 25, went to Carlisle as a youth worker and six months later, the church of 80 that we had 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 a major split, nothing to do with me. I met that gentleman over here, Rupert, who I knew through my sister Joy, and Rupert just said, had heard some of our story and said, you know, I want to have a coffee. So I went up and met with Rupert, and Rupert's been a significant part of my ongoing journey in leadership and serving Jesus. And so with Launch, what we are seeking to do is to create an environment that can equip church planters and leaders right across this nation. And I really encourage you to look at this flyer, to read it, and to look at the website, it tells you all about what it is. But I want to give you this task. You, in your mouth, maybe you're meant to respond to launch. Maybe it's for you. You sense, just like I did at the age of six, the age of 15 and 14, a sense of calling, a sense of um, excitement about what God might do. Maybe the you need to respond. But maybe if it's not you, maybe you see something in somebody else. And actually, maybe it's for you to say to somebody, you know what, I do see leadership in you. I do see that pioneering spirit to you. Maybe launch is something for you. And so together as a body, we can respond. And I really encourage you to do that. So I want to encourage you just to look at the uh, launch, understand what it is. But let me briefly say what we're doing, we're planning to do. We're starting in January for the first time. And the program is designed to work either for people who can give all their time to it, but equally for those people who are already committed to full-time education or full-time work. And it's not a teaching like academic teaching environment. It's leadership in practice. And so people who are involved in Launch will be uh, serving in their local church. So if it's here, maybe it's something you're doing. But then coming away weekly to gather, to learn, to pray, to, uh, to do that. But also then to experience and to go all around the country to see what God is doing. To, ex to connect you to new people and to see you grow in your gifts and calling. So... 
please do have a look at that. Um, and I'd really love to speak to you if that's something you're interested at the end of this time. We, I'm here just to serve the network, and I'm one of the main points of contact. So do be in contact with me. Our details are on the Scottish Network website, which is on the banners, um, and on, connected to this one here. Um, and I'd love to just be able to have a conversation with you. And it's now my privilege to hand over to Keith. He was much shorter when he was in St. John's, just a weight of responsibility. Just don't, can you imagine that? But now he's like, he's, he's gained a foot in height. Um, so it is good to have Keith here and I'm sure you're gonna have a great time listening to what Keith's got to say. Thank you so much, Stan. And I just wanna say a huge thank you for inviting me to speak. I just love coming here. It's just so great to be a, a part of your worship and invariably I meet Jesus. And I think that that's really what it's about, isn't it? You can say yes, Keith. Good, good. Um, I've entitled my talk today, and I'm going to rattle through this fairly quickly because I think time's gone off, so, uh, so it's, excuse me if I do rush a little bit. But the title of my talk today is Are You Ready to Get Your Feet Wet? Okay, that's kind of a bit of an obscure. Are you ready to get your feet wet? As Rupert and as Stan has said, that, um, BC... I used to lead a church before COVID. And you'll notice, won't you, that for every generation, there has been an event that divides history, that defines that generation, the, the before and the after. Things were one way and then they were another. Something changes something's changed and it's impossible to go back to the way things were before. For my grandparents' generation, it was World War I. And it was remarkable after the, the First World War, one of the statistics which is tragic in so many ways is that the decline in the church in the West really can be tracked back to that time particularly amongst evangelicals, it started to decline and decline rapidly as people's thoughts and understanding about God had been shaken. If God controls everything, if God's a God of love, how could he allow such atrocities to happen? It was a huge impact on a generation. For my parents' generation, it was World War II. But the strange thing about World War II was that after World War II, instead of accelerating the decline in the church, the church began to grow again. And significant things began to happen. Um, and, and I think it was probably something to do with maybe in World War I, people were disappointed in God. Maybe in World War II, People turned to God. And George VI, of course, led the nation in prayer. And of course, our current crisis is COVID. Or is it Ukraine? Or is it the state of the economy? He says, as a young Christian, I, I grew up in a church with a very strong separatist theology, come out from among them, a kind of dualist world, world view. <laughs> the church is good, the world is bad. You don't want to get too stuck into the world because it will corrupt you and it will make you bad. So come out from among them was the strong view of the church that, that, that I grew up in or, or became a Christian in. The church is good and we're okay. Because although we're miserable sinners deserving hell, we're actually in a lifeboat to heaven. That's how we thought. But of course, both world wars and the pandemic and what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening in COVID doesn't just affect the church, does it? 
it affects the whole of society. The whole of the community has been affected by this. Everybody is effective. People in the church have died just the same as people, my next door neighbours. People have caught COVID just like me. We're all in the same boat, it seems. And maybe it's not just a lifeboat to heaven. And that's what's happening here. And I just want to read a passage now, Joshua 3. And that's kind of setting up for this passage because that's what's happening in this passage. It's one of those before and after moments. One of those moments when things are never going to be the same again. Joshua 3 verse 1. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the River Jordan where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never travelled this way before, they will guide you since you've never travelled this way before. Stay about a kilometre behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure that you don't come any closer. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the ark of the covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started and went out ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, Today I will begin to make a great leader in the a great leader in the eyes of all the make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the ark of the covenant, who carry it to, to when they when you reach the banks of the river Jordan, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely try, drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the, Hiva, the, 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 the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites and the Jebusites. I think I deserve a round of applause for that. <laughs> Before you look... The Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the river, Jordan. Now choose 12 men among uh, the tribes of Israel, each one to ca- from each tribe. The priests will carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of the water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall and the people pass through on dry Land, And that's what, one of those moments that I was describing. We're living through COVID. My parents' generation lived through the World War II. It's a before and after situation. It's one of those before and after moments, like for Israel, the exodus 40 years before, that will change the whole nation and their lives forever. Verse 4. Let's look at this a bit deeper. You have never been this way before. Let's look and learn. I love this in so many ways. In verses 3 and 4, we see the priests carrying uh, the, the, the ark. And of course, we know that in the Old Testament, that the priest's role and the priest's function was to represent God to men and women and represent men and women to God. It was that kind of go-between. It, it, was, that, it, it was a priestly function to, to, to represent God. And then we come to 1 Peter 2. I thought you were going to quote this, actually, Rupert. But you, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. For you are a royal priesthood. This is talking to Christians. A holy nation. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. That's speaking of the church. That's speaking of you and me. We are a royal priesthood. 
I believe in the priesthood of all believers. I believe that every single Christian, every single follower of Jesus has the responsibility and the ability to represent God to men and women and men and women to God. Do you pray for your neighbors? Do you pray for one another? Do you speak on their behalf? We are a royal priesthood, the priesthood of all believers. And boy, does this world need us today. I believe the world needs the church today like never before. And of course, we see that the priests carry the ark, and the ark, of course, represents the very presence of God. What an amazing picture. The people of God carrying with them the presence of God so that people could see it and inviting people to follow it. That people could see and inviting people to follow it. I think so much today, that is what the church should be about. A people that carry the presence of God and invite people to follow him. I, I, I also... Um, I talked about the priesthood of all believers. I also believe in the prophethood of all believers. That every, the the, the Old Testament prophet, not in that prophethood, you know, woe is all is doom and uh, and, and you're, you know, you're in trouble, says the Lord. I, I don't mean that sort of prophet. I mean the prophet of all believers. We can all speak for God. In the 1 Corinthians 14 model, what's prophecy for? To encourage, to build up. It's not to manipulate or control. It's to bring comfort. It's to reveal God's heart to people. That's what the, why the church needs to be more prophetic. We need to be revealing more of God's heart to the people around us and inviting people to follow. And I think that's a pretty good description of the church, that we should be a people that are inviting people to, to, to follow us as we follow Jesus. Verse 4, since you've never traveled this way before, the priests will guide you. They will guide you. Guiding people into uncharted territory. I don't know about you, but this feels like we're in uncharted territory today, doesn't it? The, The world has been shaken. The church has been shaken. When things change, it's great to know that we worship a God that doesn't change. I think that's brilliant. What Israel had to learn was that what served them in Egypt wouldn't serve them in the desert. And those had to learn that what served them in the desert now wouldn't serve them as they entered the promised land. They had been nomads. Now they would be builders and settlers. They had no home. Now they would have a home. And we all need a place to belong. We all need a family. And actually that's one of the, 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 the things that we don't shout about a lot about the network, but it's one thing that, that, that is great. Uh, we were at a meeting recently and one, uh, Sarah, one of the pastors from Inverness said, it just, it just feels like my people. And it's great to be around people where you feel safe, where it's okay not to be okay. It's great to be around people that you know care for you and have got your back. So they had been, no, they had been nomads and now they would be settlers. They, they had now had to find a place to belong. Verse 5b, I I love this. It's a promise for Israel and for us that no matter how bad things may get or how bad things may appear, we must never look at the problem but look at God. There's always a but God. For tomorrow, verse says, the Lord will do great things among you. For tomorrow, the Lord will do great things among you. For the Christian, we always have a tomorrow. For the Christian, we always have a tomorrow. God's inviting us continually to walk with him into the tomorrows, to walk with him into the futures. 
Jesus even taught us, I believe, in the Lord's Prayer to pray, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, to grab that something of the future and make it a reality in, a, in, in the present. So even our prayers about bringing the future reality that we have in God into the present. Verse 8, step into the river and stand still. And verse 12 says, as soon as you f- feel the touch, of, as soon as your feet touch the water. Have you noticed that when God wants to do something significant, he rarely just does it. Invariably, he uses human agency. And in the Old Testament, we see a progression from Genesis right the way through to the New Testament where God is increasingly working in cooperation with people, which is another huge value of the network, that we we work in cooperation with one another. And and, and this is just the sort of, we we worship a God that's a, a God that empowers, that wants you to work in cooperation with him to see his will done increasingly you see God could do it on his own if he wanted to but he chooses to use you and me we step out in obedience and faith doing our bit and miracles happen because God does his bit we do our bit confident that God will do his I think that's called faith And I think that is God inviting us into a partnership with him. I I believe in miracles. But the problem is with most of us is that we want Jesus just to do it. Charismatics and Calvinists alike, we want Jesus to just to do it wouldn't it be so much easier if God just healed the sick and I didn't have to pray for them or we didn't need doctors wouldn't it be so much easier if God just sorted out injustice and I didn't have to stand up and oppose it wouldn't it be so much easier if God just eradicated poverty and I didn't have to care for the poor or do anything wouldn't that be so much easier? But a friend of mine who was sadly no longer with us used to call this kind of Disneyland Christianity because it's not how God chooses to work. Just like the priests carrying the ark, he invites us to get our feet wet, to step out. What is God inviting you to do? Are you prepared to get your feet wet, to step into the river and then to stand? It can be pretty uncomfortable and pretty challenging sometimes. William Carey, the the first, I think he was the first ever Baptist missionary, was called to India in 1793. And he was told by the religious establishment, the church, the evangelicals at the time. If God wants to save the Indians, he can do it sovereignly. He doesn't need you. Well, of course he could. But that's not how God worked. God used William Carey. And he still speaks to us today. Our world has changed. And to quote Todd Bollinger, uh, Bolsinger, who was, was a, an author we were looking at our recent network annual gathering, is what got us this far won't get us there. And I love this other quote from the book. The, the answer is not to try harder, but to start a new adventure. And in many ways, that's what we're about as a network. We want to encourage you as a church and you as individuals to be prepared to be obedient to God and to step out in faith, to be prepared to step out and start a new adventure. 
my own church that I've just come from, from St. John's, we, we, we've got a, a, an opportunity to have an asset transfer of an enormous building in the, in, in, near, near the, near the, the, the centre of town. And, and we've got, not got the money, we've not got the experience, we haven't got anything that could possibly make this happen. But as we've taken a step at a time, God is doing his bit. So what is impossible for us, maybe is not impossible for God. And I think both those quotes seem really relevant to you as a church. I believe that God's inviting Community Church Edinburgh into a new adventure. I believe he's calling you to step out and to be prepared to get your feet wet. Isaiah 43 has been a, a verse that's lived with us for such a long time. You know, Behold the Lord, do you not see it? I'm doing a new thing. Things have changed. God is doing a new thing. Let's not lament the past. Let's look forward and walk into the future with Jesus. The world has changed in many ways. There's no going back. God led Joshua and Israel across the Jordan to start a new adventure. They would build monuments or altars and institute festivals so they could remember and future generations could remember what God had done. I think remembering is good, but our focus should also be on the future. We were reminded that the God who was faithful yesterday will be faithful to us today. But God is continually calling, inviting people forward. Jesus still says, come, follow me. You see, I think to be a disciple of Jesus is to be a follower of Jesus. That means movement. That means that you will be different tomorrow and your life will be different tomorrow to what it was yesterday if you're a follower of Jesus. Do you follow the logic? Matthew 28, verse 18, so often quoted, go and make disciples of all nations. It's in the going, it's in the doing, it's in the engaging with life. Not this separatist them and us theology. It's in the going and the getting involved in life that we become a disciple of Jesus and actively follow him. We have all known a season of lament, of loss. A season... And for us at St. John's, this has been particularly real, a season of being nomads, where we didn't have a building that we could have even met in if we wanted to. Now I believe that God is inviting us to go in and possess a new land that he's promising his church here in Scotland. To begin to build, to begin to get our feet wet and our hands dirty. There's a song that we sang at our recent annual gathering. Bring down my walls of sorrow and build up my hope in you. And you know, that's my prayer for you as a community here. It's been right to lament. The majority of the Psalms are about lament. But it's also right, now I believe, to move forward. To see what God has grasped and what God is doing with you. A number of years ago, I don't remember how long ago this was, Rupert, but I, I, I had a prophetic word. I sometimes I always get prophetic words when I come to Community Church Edinburgh. Hang on, just uh, wreck the thing. Uh, and it was about snowdrops. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, w- well, I, I had a word as I was praying this morning for you, and it's about bluebells. It, it, uh, I, I like flowers. It's about bluebells. Bluebells are a sign, snowdrops are a sign of promise that, that winter's coming to an end, that spring is coming. Bluebells are a sign that spring is here. The weather's warming up. It's a foretaste, actually, of summer. You begin, your hope begins to rise, doesn't it? As you see the, the greens, the birds begin to sing, the dawn choruses start, the, the leaves begin to burst out, and the bluebells are a sign that winter is over and that we're about to enter summer. 
The cold winds still make us shudder, but we know that they're not going to last. And I sense for you as a church, and maybe for individuals here, that you need to hear that word today, the word of bluebells. And you need to begin to experience the new thing that God's doing, the new season, the warmth of the sun. This is not where you're going to end up, but it's a foretaste of what God is doing. And I sense it's warm. I have had many before and after moments in my life. Leaving home, getting married, having children, having grandchildren, although I try to deny that one. I can't be that old, surely. I was talking to my 16-year-old grandson recently, and I was explaining about the time when, when, when his Uncle Peter, our first son, was, was born, and how suddenly, overnight, I felt responsible and I had to grow up. And he looked at me, as only a 16-year-old grandson can, and I, t- I think it was a compliment. He said, what do you mean, Grandpa? You haven't grown up yet. But, uh, but, <laughs> but do you know, for me, by far the most significant before and after was the day that I first made the decision to follow Jesus. It's a decision that has affected every area of my life and every subsequent decision that I would make. But it's a decision that I've had to make daily. Jesus put it this way, take up your cross and follow me. It's not a decision that I've always been able to make. But it's a choice that daily I have to make to be a follower of Jesus. And many times, like the Israelites, I've been tempted to turn back. Many times I've failed and let God down. But God has always been faithful. God has always been present, has always offered hope. But I daily had to make that choice. And so do you. What was that song we sang? You're in every step I take. And I think, I'm just going to leave that there. You're in every step I take. I promise you, we worship a God that's gone before you. I promise you that this morning, if you make that decision, you may have made it 10, 20, 30 years ago to be a Christian. But again this morning, if you make that decision that today I'm going to follow Jesus, this will be another before and after moment. And I invite you. I have never, ever regretted that decision. I love that verse. Jesus doesn't say just come to me and have eternal life. In John 17, he says, come to me and I'll give you life abundant and life to the full. And that's in the midst of all that's going on in our world. And that's the hope that we have to offer a world that so desperately needs to hear it. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I just invite you to come and to make yourself known to each and every person here. Father, I sense that some of us are still suffering from the trauma of COVID, from the uncertainty of the economic situation that we face. But thank you. Thank you, Lord, that in the midst of that, you meet us and are with us. And today, Lord, we choose to follow you. Today, we choose to follow you.